Hey, Luke Hart here. So today I'm going to be reviewing the Marmalade Dog 23 convention that took place over in Kalamazoo, Michigan, March 31st through April 2nd. So the long and short of it is that the convention was super fun, had lots of fun, it was really, really cool. And I got this shirt out of it too. Now, I do wanna give you a little bit of forewarning. If you're accustomed to my normal videos, this is gonna be a little bit different. I, Since I was traveling to a convention, I thought to myself, hmm, good opportunity to do a vlog on this. Now, the forewarning here is that this is the first time I've attempted to do this. My guess is that as vlogs go, this is probably gonna suck. So, let's go. Right, here is the Barnhard Center. This is where it all takes place. This is where Marmalade Dog 23 happens. It's quite a full parking lot back here. Uh, fortunately, there is there's always room for one more. All right, just got off the elevator. You're waiting in the lobby area for Marmalade Dog. And here's like a little poster they have out front of the ballroom. Uh, they don't let us go in until like 2.30. Okay, so here's the thing. Last year with the Marmalade Dog, I signed up for the very first slot on Friday. And I got there and found out that I am not, that they don't actually open up to let you in line until a half hour before the first slot begins. And so last year I found myself waiting in line for like 15 minutes to try to get registered and stuff, get my shirt, get my junk, and go to my table, only to find out they didn't give me a double table, they gave me one table, so I had to like finagle two tables together and get all of my stuff set up in like 10 minutes for the first slot. But it would be much, much cooler if I had more time to do that stuff. So this year, I did not sign up for the first slot. I knew how it worked, I knew I'd be in a rush, and so I didn't DM the very first slot. I was just a player in that first slot and I ended up DMing in the second slot on Friday because I didn't want to have to be rushed to register and stuff. All right, I just got my shirt. I really like these colors. I think um, the last year's convention, the colors were like brown and white or something. I didn't like it a whole lot, but these are really super cool colors. So definitely digging the shirt for sure. So my wife and daughter are traveling under aliases. They are Patty and Lizzie. This is where they're getting the the pod set up for like the, the war walker stuff. I don't know what the heck it is, but it's pretty cool. So it is only, so it's Friday. It's like a little after two or something like that, 2.30, something like that. And uh, people are just kind of starting to arrive. There's a line. Uh, I have signed up for some dungeon crawl classic stuff. Um, should be cool. So we'll check that out. All right, here we go. It is Marmalade Dog 23. This is like Friday night. It's like 11.30 or something like that, guys. Yeah, like and that. I am here with one of my first groups here. Um, they just got done capturing Ashton Sanguin. This guy right here, like, sweet-talked, uh, if you can see my finger pointing at him, he sweet-talked his way out of certain death at one point. Yep. It was totally awesome, and they all vanquished this blue-skinned dude right there. Here's like a shot of the game board and stuff. Thanks a lot, guys, for playing. All right. All right, let's talk logistics real quick. First of all, uh, the Barnhard Center is where this thing was held. There was plenty of parking, no issues whatsoever with parking. There were no issues at all finding hotels to stay in. I mean, my hotel was about 15 minutes away, but I could have easily gotten one within like five or 10 minutes of the place. Not a problem at all. So that is all positives as far as that goes. So the ballroom itself had plenty of room to play. It was not crowded at all. I think probably in the video you noticed that. The, the noise level I feel was acceptable. Um, I, I obviously would love to have private rooms, but I think that's probably asking too much. So when I run my games, I need two big tables to put together because I have these like really big grid and then the miniatures that I run on it. And there's really no way to tell them in advance that you need two tables. And so most of the time I was getting stuck with one little narrow table, which is great if you're doing theater to the mind, but if you want some minis and battle maps and crap like that, then that's not gonna cut it. And so I was constantly having to, before each of my slots, go talk to them, finagle things, and try to get two tables together. So it would be wonderful if there were a way to sign up for two tables from the get-go. 
All right, here we go. We are heading to day two of Marmalade Dog 23. So today what I'm gonna be doing is uh, I, there's a there's a fifth edition slot in the morning that I'm gonna be a player in. There was also you know there was a there was a Call of Cthulhu one that I was thinking of doing, um, but I I don't know I wanna I kind of want to play some fifth edition as a player. I haven't been able to do that yet. Last night I played uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics as a player, and um, you know it wasn't it wasn't too bad. You know um, the DM had a, a different style than than I've, I've ever come into before. I think that's cool. I think it's awesome to um, just learn different ways different people run the game, you know, because I got a yellow light here. I think you can learn a lot from, like, um, I gotta be careful that some policeman doesn't see me with my phone and stuff like that, so I'll do a little shot from down here. I think it's really cool to, like, play with, one of the, one of the big reasons that I'm a player in other, I should turn the music off on my radio so that's not overpowering the sound. But one of the big reasons that I am a player in D&D games, one of the in, in conventions that I go to, is that I want to play with other DMs. I want to see what they do. I want to see how they run the game because, um, I mean, I think I've said it before, but I think that, you know, DMs can learn a lot from each other, um, not just from talking about it, from just being a player in each other's games and seeing how they run the game. Um, you can see what things work, what things don't work, you know, and you can learn from that. So that's one of the reasons I'm a player in different games. And I like to try different systems out, like Dungeon Crawl Classic, like last night. And I was thinking of doing a Call of Cthulhu, but I really want to do a 5th edition as well. And I think this is this slot in the morning right now that I'm driving to is probably going to be the only opportunity that I have to play 5th edition. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Although I would I would love to do a Call of Cthulhu at some point too. Um, just to kind of learn that, just a little bit about that system would be awesome. So, but today we're going to focus on, so I'll, run a, I'll play 5th edition as a player this morning. And then um, after that, the second slot of today, I'll be running Finding Ashton Sanguine again. Uh, I ran it last night. It was really cool. The guys, the guys spent probably about two thirds of the session just investigating, tracking things down, and it was all social interactions. It was a lot of fun. I got to do lots of my voices that I like doing, my Granny Titchwillow voice and stuff like that. So it was that was tons of fun. I really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, and ultimately, the guys tracked Ashton Sanguine down to his hideout um, with some orcs and like a hill giant, and they defeated him and they captured him. And we, it was going right up to the last second of the convention too, when they were about to kick us out. And I think that, you know, that's interesting because when you're running a convention, that is one of the things that a DM really has to be thinking about, how he manages his time, right? Because eventually he's gonna get kicked out. Eventually the time slot is over and the players need to go to the next game. And you have basically four hours to run the game. And part of juggling it, you're not only delivering an awesome game experience while they're there, but you really wanna give them a satisfying ending right and um, trying to like got in a way you're guiding them to that ending if at all possible you know and and hoping they get there in a way or or they die trying right because that's always an option as well but I, I mean hopefully they would die toward the end of the four hour game slot because if you just killed them all in the first 20 minutes and you're like sorry guys you all lost game over I think that would be very very disappointing as a player so yeah, uh, that's part of it. So yeah, I'm gonna go do that today. I don't think I'm gonna do anything for the, the third slot today. It's gonna be about seven o'clock when I finish up my game. And I think I just wanna head back to the hotel, hang out with my wife and daughter, and we'll go out to eat and stuff. And we'll just kinda, you know, chill in the hotel room, which is always a fun part of vacationing. So this is the one that I wanted to play in. And as you can see right here, pre-filled. That's bull crap right there. All right. So here is how we find which one we're gonna play in. Yeah, so that's a bunch of crap. Um, the one I wanted to play in was somehow pre-filled, and so now I have to find another one to play in. This is this is why you should be able to like sign up for stuff online for sure. Okay, so criticism. Um, something I did not like about something I do not like about how they run this convention is they don't allow you to sign up for games in advance of the actual convention. Like you can't go online and sign up for the games or anything like that. Basically what you do is you need to, you just show up a half hour before the slot begins and that's when you sign up. And if the game, so you get this little booklet the first day that tells you all the different games and stuff. And I was like planning out which games I wanted to play in. And if you plan out which ones you want to play in, you're like all pumped up and jacked and ready to go. And then you show up and the game slot is full, or in my case, one of them was pre-filled, then you're just screwed and you have no recourse except to pick a different game. It would be wonderful 
absolutely awesome if the, pe if the folks who did Marmalade Dog would let you pre-sign up for the games in advance. I don't know a whole lot about how conventions are run and all the nuances of why you might pre-fill or why you might have people sign up in advance and why you might not. I don't know all the reasons and details. Um, but from the way I think, my manner of thinking, I think it would be really cool to be able to do that. But I can, there are probably reasons why they don't. All right, rock and roll, here we go. So I am getting ready to run my game at Marmalade Dog 23. Uh, this is Saturday, this is my afternoon slot or whatever. All right, sweet, I'm gonna give you guys a look at my setup on the table here. Um, just kind of what I put, what's behind my screen, how I have everything laid out, and like kind of how I present it to the players uh, when they come into my convention, just to help them make a decision about like what player, what character they're gonna play, and uh, what they're picking, and just all that kind of good stuff. So I got my players behind me. This is for slot two. They are just kind of like reviewing their character sheets and stuff, getting ready to go. So we're about ready to begin. Um, it's gonna be fun. We will see if they capture Ashton Sanguine. All right, sweet. We just finished up slot two on Saturday, and these guys all just captured Ashton Sanguine in like a crazy awesome way. So this is my group of six players here uh, that we played with today at this slot. So it was tons of fun, really, really awesome. All right, so here is another, another thing that I think would make the convention better. I don't know if it's normal for conventions to only have a half hour in between games. That might be a thing, I don't know. But what it really creates for, I think for the Marmalade Dog 23, half hour slots between your games, right? What it creates for the players and for the DM, well for the players, they have a half hour to go get some food, right? At like Subway, Subway was the place downstairs in the basement where you could get food. So, and I think there was a Big Beats down there too. And so, I mean, you went, they're not gonna starve, but you got limited options, right? You have a half hour to go get food before you can, you know, come up to your next game. And if, imagine, imagine if you have like 50 people swarming Subway in that half hour between games, right? You got a line going on, right? So for DMs, however, it's compounded even more because not only do you maybe need to go get food or something or drink or a coffee or something, but you also got to stop the current, like if I was a player, I gotta leave that game, right? I gotta go, if I'm gonna take all of my DM stuff with me to that convention center, I could do that. I didn't, I was leaving my DM stuff in the car. Right, because I didn't want to carry around all my junk, my miniatures and all this stuff with me when I was a player, right? It took a lot of space and blah, 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 whatever. So as a DM, I needed to, I had a half hour basically to go to my car, get my DM stuff, bring it all the way back. That's gonna be a 50 minute thing right there all by itself and get it all set up. I mean, it takes me almost a half hour maybe to get my stuff set up comfortably without being rushed, right? I can't do all that in a half hour as a DM, I can't. And so what I did, I actually, this is what I did to the Call of Cthulhu game I was in. I had to leave it a half hour early, basically, so that I could go to my car, get my stuff, bring it back in, and get set up, you know? And I felt really bad because it was an awesome game. I was having lots of fun. Um, but because of the half hour between slots, I didn't have much of a choice. It was either leave my game early or be rushed and flustered, perhaps, to run my own game and have it not start on time. And so it would be super, super cool if we had 45 minutes or an hour between slots. I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason they do it that way. That's a possibility. And this might be a thing. That might be normal. I might be the only person that has a problem with that. I don't know. I'm just saying that that's one thing that I would appreciate if the time between slots were a little bit longer. All right, check this stuff out. This is like the, the battle pods back here. Uh, this is like the Artemis Bridge where they do that type of stuff back there. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, here, people are just kind of chilling, waiting for uh, the next round of the battle pods. They got a like, little screen set up and a little waiting thing where you can do that. It's pretty cool. This is pretty slick. I like this stuff. All right, so I'm gonna do a little pan here. You can see like kind of a scope of this place and how, how big it is and all the all the gaming that they got going on here. Uh, really totally cool stuff. They got like they got like vendors against the walls, kind of like ringing the whole like ballroom and stuff like that, just selling different D and D stuff and role playing stuff. And you can see like just a bunch of people chilling, hanging out, and playing games. So as you can see, lots of empty tables. So um, if you're not signed up for a game, you can do like a pickup game or something like that. Totally totally worth checking out if you're in the area. 
and it's like super cheap. It's like 25 bucks for the weekend. You get in and play games all the time. So, and if you DM or GM or whatever, then you get like free admission. So it's like totally awesome. Despite the wide variety of games being offered, I think one of my criticisms or I don't know if it's necessarily a criticism, but there just weren't a lot of D&D 5e games being offered. And so, I mean, I think I was one of the few DMs actually playing 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. All right, so I just played some of those like mecha pods type of things. And that was like a lot of fun. Uh, I'm walking back to my car now. Um, it's like 7.30 or something like that. Uh, I told my wife I would be back to the hotel room at 7-inch or something. I'll go get some food and stuff like that. So that was pretty cool. Um, tomorrow, uh, Sunday, the last day of the convention, the game plan is for all of us, my daughter, my wife, and I, to come here. I'll run my last slot of Finding Ash and Sanguine, and then we'll probably play mech pods and stuff together, I imagine. So that should be pretty cool. So we're kind of going through, like, um, what is Western Michigan University campus, something like that. So that's pretty cool. It looks pretty, it looks pretty legit. So I, I want to offer some thoughts on my last game session. Um, so uh, yesterday the guys actually tracked Ashton Sanguine back to his hideout and they found him and they fought against like some orcs and uh, stuff that they'd allied, he'd allied with. Um, tonight, however, they did not find... Um, they did not have enough time. That, so basically what's happening is the game session only lasted until 6.30 and they got into, they got into a fight with Granny Titchwillow, um, a, a purported witch who turned out to be an Anis hag. And that fight took, that, that was a good hour long battle, hour and a half maybe? I don't know, it was a pretty good sized fight. Um, but these guys had done like probably a couple hours of just social interactions, talking with people, um, sleuthing out, uh, trying to find out and track down where Ashton Sanguine is. And so they got into this um, witch who was being pretty helpful and nice to them. Um, but ultimately, one of the players is, he's the type of player that, like, he just, he makes things happen, right? Often through things that people might say is not the wisest thing to do, but when things are getting boring or things don't appear to be, like, going, going anywhere productive, he just does stuff. He pokes at things. He makes stuff happen. And so he kicked off a fight with Granny Titchwillow. Um, Anna's hag, she had scarecrows, um, a really, really cool thing, but it took a while. And so when they got done fighting her, um, they uh, there was only like about a half an hour left in the game session. And so they were there's no way they were going to be able to um, get all the way to Ashton Sanguin's hideout and fight anything, basically. And so I had the Hand of Light, a competing adventuring company, already have captured Ashton Sanguin, and I set the whole um, I, ho I set the whole adventure up, I'm getting like an incoming call, private number. So I'm just gonna ignore that. So I set the whole adventure up so that there was a competing adventuring company to try to kind of rush them a little bit, give them a sense of urgency. And basically, what happened is they ran into the Hand of Light, who had already captured Ashton Sanguine and were drawing him back. And one of the players, I mean, they could have fought the Hand of Light and tried to get Ashton Sanguine and stuff, but one of the players had found a love potion number 11 in Granny Titchwillow's stuff. And so what he did is he, he got all of the Hand of Light to, he could convince them to, that he wanted to give them a celebratory toast, basically, and celebrate their victory in capturing Ashton Sanguine. And so, basically, they all got around like a little campfire for lunchtime and stuff. And he made some like persuasion and um, checks and all of this kind of thing. We got some police officers up here, so I'm just gonna kind of chill out for a moment. Make sure we got nothing crazy going on. Weird. Okay. All right. So um, they were passing around these celebratory drinks. And the, the halfling rogue, whose idea all this was, is he had found a love potion number 11 in Granny Titchwell's stuff. And he started pouring this stuff into their drinks of this Hand of Light competing adventuring band. And as they began drinking it, um, the Hand of Light, basically what the potion does is it causes the, it causes the imbiber to fall in love with the first person that he sets his eyes on. And so all of the Hand of Light began falling in love with each other or with the, 
the players, characters, and um, basically they they were just all enamored of someone or something. Some basically someone they were enamored of, and so at that point, I mean, the players were just having a riot at that point. This was like absolutely awesome. You should, you should have seen these guys' faces. They're just having so much fun um, with this awesome result. And basically the halfling at this point just took Ashton Sanguine and just walked off with him. And the Hand of Light was so enamored of like whoever they had fallen in love with, they didn't do anything about it. And it was like an absolutely awesome ending. Um, and we ended up the session on time and everything, um, so it was really cool. This is the sort of, see, this is the sort of story that like um, you, you tell people about, right? This awesome ending that you had to a campaign. Now, they could have just had like a battle, right? And fought them and stuff like that. And that's not the sort of thing that you would remember, right? But like causing them to fall in love with each other and then just walking off with him, that is so awesome. That's such a great idea on part of that player. And um, and I think this is, this is one of the things too that like um, sometimes a DM might be tempted to say no to something like that and just not let it happen. But ultimately, saying yes to those sorts of things, that is what creates moments in your game that you remember for a long time. Remember that time that it, it leads those conversations and is just ultimately super, super cool. So that was an awesome session. Those guys, um, and I'll probably show a little video um, with them behind me and crap like that, but those guys and that girl, they, they were awesome, awesome players. And one of the things, one of the things that really is awesome as a DM, and this is this is this is what the DM gets out of it all. Okay, is running a game and just seeing these looks of delight and amusement and just having fun on your players' faces. And when you see this, when you see your players having fun, just enjoying themselves, loving it, that's awesome. That that is an awesome thing as a DM. It doesn't get much better than that. So. Great session tonight. Uh, liked it a lot. Heading home to my wife and daughter. We're going to go get some food. Um, we're, I'm hungry. I'm sure they're hungry. My wife is calling me right now, actually. So I'm going to have to peace out on that. So Dog 23. Um, just get, got all my stuff set up, got my table ready to roll. Uh, people are rolling in. We're gonna start in just a little bit. All right, just got done with the last slot on Sunday, Marmalade Dog 23. Um, this is my group behind me here that they were playing. Um, they also captured, captured Ashton Sanguine, uh, did a great job doing it. So lots of fun, lots of cool stuff. So there we go, and that was my last slot. And that's that's the end of the weekend kind of for me. I might go play some other stuff, but um, that's the last time I'm gonna be running a game. Marmalade Dog 23 is over. We just got done playing um, some of the mech, the tech mech things or whatever the heck they're called. That was pretty cool, but I do it for so long and then my head starts to kind of hurt, so. All right, time to go home. So my final thoughts on this, um, as a as a dungeon master, as, as a DM running games at Marmalade Dog, I was super satisfied, super, super happy. It was lots of fun and my games all filled up. I had no problems getting players and so as a DM, A+. Now I think that if I were if I were purely a D&D &D player and I showed up wanting to run 5th edition and that's kind of like my thing, then I probably would have been a little disappointed because there weren't as many fifth edition offerings as I would have liked. Um, but there were, like I said, there were lots of, there was a wide variety of other game offerings. And so, but that's a little something, you know, D&D players, you know, you might want to take into consideration. However, if you like dabbling in new game systems, and you don't mind playing something that you're not super familiar with or that you've never done before, then I think it's pretty good. I mean, you're going to be able to find a wide variety of things there. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, share with your friends, and consider subscribing. Please let me know down in the comments other conventions that you've gone to, that you've enjoyed a lot, and that you would recommend to others. Until next time, let's play D&D.